our next teacher this morning, but I don't feel like, I mean, I know I'm supposed to be up here introducing Shane and probably doesn't need an introduction, but I also feel like I need to defend the staff this morning, all right? Uh, when Caleb made the announcement about the office being closed on Monday for Columbus Day, I got a text that said, really? Yes. And you can judge us, and I feel no shame having the day off tomorrow. <laughs> so just want you to know that, all right? But, uh, hey, we are excited this morning to have Shane Allen back. And if you know him, he had a ministry here that uh, was for five years. Uh, he took over for me in 2006. And then I went down to Texas, and he uh, ran the youth program, the student program here for five years, and kept it running strong. And then I came back and took over for him. So our lives are kind of wrapped into each other. And before he left to go to Illinois, uh, we were neighbors, right? That's right. Yeah, and so we got to spend a lot of time together, and I am so thankful to have a brother like this walking in ministry with me and hopefully me with him as we serve the kingdom. And we want to welcome Shane Allen this morning. Give it up for Shane. I heard a story about a married couple that was in their 90s, and they were both having problems remembering things. Well, during a checkup, a doctor told them that things were all right physically, but he recommended that they might start writing some things down to, to help them remember. Well, later that night, while they were watching TV, the old man, he gets up from his chair, and he asks his wife, he says, Hey, do you want anything while I'm in the kitchen? She says, Well, will you get me a bowl of ice cream? He says, Sure. Well, don't you think that you should write it down so you don't forget? No, no, I, I, I can remember it. She says, well, I'd like some strawberries on top, too. Maybe you should write that down so you don't forget it. He said, no, I can remember that. You want a bowl of ice cream, and you want strawberries on top. She said, well, I'd also like some whipped cream. I'm certain that you're going to forget that, so why don't you go ahead and write that down? Now, real irritated, he said, I don't need to write it down. I can remember you want a bowl of ice cream with strawberries and whipped cream on top. For goodness sake. Well, then he walked into the kitchen, and after about 20 minutes, the old man, he returned from the kitchen, and he handed his wife a plate of bacon and eggs. She stared at the plate for a second, and she said, where's my toast? <laughs> it's important that we remember. It's important that we remember why we exist as a church. First Christian, it is so good to be with you here today. I am, I am so excited about where you are, and I'm even more excited about where you're going. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, the Bible says, Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Years ago, whenever I was just a boy, this church stepped out on faith, and they, they built a new gym. The cost at the time was a staggering $600,000. But this congregation was convinced that in order to reach more people that didn't know Jesus Christ, that they needed to move, they needed to act, and they needed to build. Right away, this church raised 80% of the money that was needed. And before you were done building the gym, you'd already paid it off. Now, that would have been a really great time as a church to just stop and say, wow, look at what God has done. But you didn't, because you had a mission to fulfill. In the past 11 and a half years, some of those years with me being a part of this congregation, and some of those years with me being on the sidelines cheering you guys on, I've seen Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 lived out in this church, and I, just like it was lived out years before. In the past 10 years, there have been 118 people at least that have given their life to Christ and been baptized right here. Now think about that for a second. Every month, every month for the past 10 years, someone new, someone who didn't have a relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, has been saved for all of eternity because of the ministry of First Christian Church. Now you could stop right now. This would be a great time to just stop and say, wow, look at what God has done. But I truly believe that the work of our Lord is just getting started. There are so many churches that pray for revival, but I believe that you're right in the middle of one right now. And I'm so excited to see the older generation of this church sacrifice. 
You're sacrificing things like the, the rooms in which you've studied in for years because you care about the future of this church. You know, you're willing to give up the things that you love for the things that you love even more, like seeing this church flourish for another hundred plus years. And I can promise you this, you are setting an example for the younger generation that they will not forget whenever they're faced with similar situations years down the road. You know, what has happened in this church is incredible. And it's great for us to remember, but I want to share with you from Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19. It says, but forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I am about to do, for I am going to do something new. See, I've already begun. God is just, it is fixing to do something bigger. I believe that FCC is just getting started. You know, the mission of this church is to love God, to love others, and to serve both. That comes from Jesus in Matthew chapter 22. There was a religious leader. He asked Jesus, which commandment was the greatest? And then Jesus, he answered in Matthew 22, verse 20, or 37 and 38. It says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The best way that you can love God, love others, and serve both is by sharing the gospel, by sharing the good news about Jesus with people that don't know him. As a church, you've got to keep aggressively and unashamedly trying to motivate people to make Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior, to make, them the, make him the leader of their lives. This is the reason that First Christian Church exists. Now, over the years, your methods have changed. Your buildings have changed, your personnel has changed, but the message and the purpose of this church has not changed from the very beginning of time. I believe that God has a unique purpose in mind for this church. I believe that you have opportunities right now that are unmatched at any time in this church's long history. After his death on the cross and after he was raised from the dead, before he went back, back to heaven in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, it says, Jesus came and he told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of age. You know, we've made Jesus the leader of our lives. We're trying to obey his commands to go into all the world and to make more Christians. Paul, he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. We should be trying to persuade people to come to Jesus Christ. The goal of this church should be to grow. This church does not exist to pay bills to hold worship services, to keep the members of this church happy. The purpose of this church is to reach the lost. And in order to do that, that means that we must grow. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus, he told three parables to, to show the importance whenever it comes to reaching the lost. Jesus, he was being criticized by some of the religious leaders of his day. They, they were giving him a hard time for hanging out with such sinful people. They said, Jesus, you know, if you were, were really good, you wouldn't be friends with such bad people. Well, in order to explain his mission, Jesus, he told three parables. He said, first, he said, well, let's, let's imagine that you had a hundred sheep and, and you lost one. What would you do? You would leave the 99 and you would go out into the woods. You would go out into the cliffs and you would search until you found that lost one. Then you would put that lamb on your shoulders and you'd go home. You'd call all your neighbors in to celebrate with you because what was lost has been found. Then Jesus, he went on to say, well, that's the exact way that God feels. You know, there is more rejoicing in heaven over, over one sinner who repents than over 99 who don't need it. Then Jesus, he shared another parable. He said, women, what would you do if you lost one of ten valuable coins? Now, maybe some of you ladies in here have lost a wedding ring before. And you know the panic that ensues as soon as you lose that wedding ring. What would you do? You would, you would look all over trying to find that wedding ring. You wouldn't just blow it off and say, oh, it's no big deal. I'll just go out to the store and I'll get another one. No, you, you would search and search. And Jesus said, what you do with this coin is you turn on the lights. 
You sweep out the house, you search carefully until you find it, and whenever you do, you're thrilled. And in the same way, there is joy in the presence of the, the angels of heaven whenever one sinner repents. Then Jesus, he shared one last parable in, in Luke 15 about a boy that was lost. There was this son. He rebelled. He took his dad's money. He headed off to the big city, and it was in this big city that he got lost in sin. And whenever his money was gone, whenever his friends were gone, whenever his integrity was gone, he came to his senses and he finally came home. And whenever his father saw him coming home, he ran out and he hugged him. And he called for all of his servants and he said, we must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine that was dead has now returned to life. So Jesus, he made his point. He was being criticized for, for reaching out to, to lost people. But that was the reason that he came into this world. You know, how was he ever going to, to influence people if he didn't care for them? How was he ever going to be able to influence them if he never associated with them? So if our mission is to love God, to love others, and to serve both, let's not let that mission just be words. Let's let that mission be the lifeblood of this church. Well, from those three parables this morning, I want us to see the motivation for, the method of, and the reaction to reaching the lost. So the first thing that I want you to, to see today, if you've got your notes, is our motivation should be that we love lost people. We love lost people. You know, the right motivation is very important because it's possible for us to do the right thing, but yet still have the wrong motivation. In Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, they, they sold a field. And they gave a real large chunk of their money to the church. Now that, that was a great thing, but their motivation was pride. They, they were so hungry for the approval of people that they lied about the percentage that they had given. Now you can aggressively be trying to grow the church, but you can be doing it for the wrong reasons. In Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24, David, he wrote, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Our motivation for wanting this church to grow should be that we love lost people. Jesus, he made it very clear that people who follow him would live forever with God. And people that, 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 that don't follow him would be separated from God forever. Jesus, he divided people into two categories. He had people that were headed to heaven and he had people that were headed to hell. Jesus talked about people that walked in darkness. He talked about people that walked in the light. Jesus talked about people that believed in the truth. He talked about people that believed in a lie. And he said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. That's why Peter said this about Jesus in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. He says, There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven in which we must be saved. If we really understand that people are lost forever without Jesus, and if we care about people, what we need to do is we've got to reach out. We've got to share the good news about Jesus Christ. We've got to love people that are lost spiritually. We've got to care about people that are in danger of being destroyed by the devil. Paul was a man that cared for the lost. Paul left everything that he had to go and to tell people about Jesus. In Acts chapter 20, verse 24, he said, My life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Jesus, he cared about people who were endangered of being destroyed by Satan. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, it says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Well, that brings me to our method for reaching the lost. The method that is suggested in Luke chapter 15 in the parables is that you must aggressively seek people who are lost. You must aggressively seek people who are lost. The shepherd went out and looked for the sheep. The woman searched the whole house for the coin. When we really love lost people, we do everything that we possibly can to try to rescue them. That's exactly what Jesus did. He did it tactfully, but he did it aggressively. He tried to find every single person that he could. That's why Jesus started a conversation with the woman that was at the well. 
That's why he called to, to Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, come down. Come have a meal with me. That's why he welcomed in the woman that was uh, committing adultery and he forgave her. That's why he stayed up and he talked half the night with Nicodemus. That's why one of the very last things that Jesus did was reach out to a thief that was dying beside him and say, today you will be with me in paradise. In Jesus, he commands us to go into all the world and to make disciples of all nations. When was the last time that you talked to somebody about your faith? Somebody that wasn't a Christian. When, when was the last time that you invited somebody to come to church with you? Now, people say things like, well, you know, I, I don't know who's saved. I don't, I don't know who's lost. I don't know who's a Christian. I don't know who's not. Well, there was a recent study that showed that only about 20% of Americans go to church on the weekend. So that means 80% don't. So there is about 16,000 people right here in Sepulpa that do not go to church on the weekends. So why not just start with those people? Find people who are unchurched and invite them to come to church with you. That is a simple and a very practical way that we can reach the lost. The Institute for American Church Growth surveyed about 10,000 people and asked them, what was it that led you to come to church? 75% said that they came to church because of an invitation from a friend or a relative. 75%. Norman Vincent Peale, he said, Jesus taught us to be fishers of men, and if you're not fishing, you're not following. Our methods have to be like Jesus. We've got to be on the lookout for the lost. But I believe that our method, it has two parts. First, we aggressively, we seek lost people. And then secondly, we do our best to attract people who are lost. We do our best to attract people who are lost. One of the most practical ways that you can reach out to lost people is to provide an environment here in the church that people are attracted to. I hope that whenever people come in those doors of this church building, they, they feel an instant acceptance. They feel an, in, an instant love. I hope that they feel a warm and caring atmosphere. This church ought to be a place that people are attracted to. David wrote in Psalm 122, verse 1, I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Now maybe you've been a Christian for a really long time, and there are some things that happen in the church nowadays that you just don't identify with. Maybe there's some things that even happened in this church that you don't even agree with. You might say things like, well, you know, I don't know why they sing all those new songs. I don't know why they, they have those lights on the back wall. I don't, I don't know why they print all the Bible verses on a piece of paper. You know, we're more than capable of carrying a Bible to church. I don't know why people applaud or why people laugh. I don't know why people wear jeans to church. Well, let me encourage you to be mature enough to understand that the church is not all about you. There are people in this world who have been so turned off by the church that they can't be reached in a traditional way. There are people out there that are hurting so much that whenever they come in, we've got to be sensitive to them. There are people, believe it or not, that are so easily bored that we've got to work really hard to try to keep their attention. Paul, he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything that I can to save some. Well, the last thing that I want us to see together this morning from the Luke 15 parables is the reaction to seeking the lost. The natural reaction to seeking the lost is celebration. The natural reaction to seeking the lost is celebration. The shepherd said, rejoice with me, celebrate with me, because I have found my lost sheep. The woman, she said, rejoice with me, because I have found my lost coin. The father said, we must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. But you know, not everybody celebrates. Jesus, he said to the Pharisees, he says, you guys, you, you're always criticizing me. You, you, what kind of religion do you even have? I want you to look at Jesus' words in Luke chapter 15, verse 25 to 28. It says, Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants, What's going on? Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We're celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry, and he wouldn't go in. Whenever the church grows, there's always going to be some people on the outside that resent it. They feel threatened by it. 
They, they see it as a danger because it's going to change lifestyles. Well, you bet it is, and boy, do we ever need it. You know, sometimes there's people inside the church that resent its growing because they somehow they, they, make it feel, they feel like it's going to make them less important. They kind of feel like this older brother. They resent the growth because it makes them feel like they're maybe not as necessary. But the father said to the, son, the older son in Luke chapter 15, verse 31 and 32, Look, dear son, you've always stayed by me, and everything that I have is yours. We had to celebrate this day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. That spirit of celebration should be really obvious whenever a church grows, whenever people become Christians. In Luke 15, verse 7, Jesus said, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. If there is joy and if there is celebration in heaven over one lost sinner that repents and returns to God, then I believe that we ought to celebrate too. You rub shoulders every day with people who, who do not know Jesus Christ. Now they may have an in name only church membership somewhere, their parents maybe dedicated them whenever they were kids, but they have personally never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're not allowing Him to be the leader of their life. They're not allowing His words to guide their life. And if I understand the Bible correctly, there, there are people that are going to be dying without the promise of eternal life. Jesus Christ has called you. He's called you to witness to them. Now that's not always easy, but that's our responsibility. The least that you can do is invite them to church with you. Better still, why don't you tell them about the difference that Jesus is making in your life? First Christian Church exists to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus Christ, by loving God, by loving others, and serving both. The most important thing that you can do is share the good news with a lost and dying world. Let's pray. Father, I am so thankful for what you're doing right here in this church. I am excited about the days ahead. I'm, I'm excited for the things that are happening right now. And God, I pray that you continue to lead and guide this church. Father, I'm excited about Lance and his new ministry that is starting here. And Father, I pray that you continue to speak to him. Give him your words, your wisdom. Give him your guidance on the, on the vision that is best for this church. Father, bless this church in a mighty way. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.